This is called a boat, and chapter one is origins. There are few places on earth that lend themselves as readily to philosophical discussions as do duck blinds. Even single occupant blinds where there is nobody else to talk to and you would expect a lack of conversation unless the sole inhabitant has a split personality and is prone to having double identity discussions have a tendency to become ruminative. They tend to encourage philosophical thought processes even if there is no one else there to have philosophical discussions with which very frequently leads to walks down memory lane, like one morning last fall, for example. To begin with, it wasn't so much a blind as it was a stand. Rather than sitting on anything, I was standing in knee-deep water next to the boat alone. For seconds, the morning had been lively enough to keep a half dozen occupants of a blind busy, let alone a sole proprietor. The October hurricane, we had so many in 1995, the weather service almost ran out of names to call them had blown down several thousand feet of water oak across that last slough running south towards Majors Creek. To compound the felony, the month of November, normally the driest month we have, dropped enough rain in the first four days to put the river at flood stage, believe it or not, the week before Thanksgiving. There is not supposed to be a flood in the river swamp the week before Thanksgiving. It says so right here in the small print. Such a volume of water in direct contravention of the contract coupled with the necessities to go to other places and salvage higher value timber than the hurricane had blown down. Through the area between the last slough and the north bank of Majors Creek into that category best defined as informed neglect. It needed fixing and under normal circumstances it would be corrected quickly. But with the situation as it was last fall, nobody was going to trouble himself for five minutes with blown down water oak and 18 inches of water. $400 a thousand pine saw logs blown flat across an area the size of half a county turned in blue while they waited for the advent of the southern pine beetle eliminated any priority that defective water oak with epicomic branches may have had under normal circumstances. As a consequence, getting a boat to the back side of the beaver pond that borders this last slough in the dark with everything looking different because so many of the marker trees had been blown down and were prostrate was not only slow, it was glacial, and it was frustrating to boot. Water oak cross-pollinates with both laurel oak and willow oak, so to be intellectually honest about it, you really can't call it water oak, although everybody does. The tree is a genetic mixture of all three in various proportions, a biological meatloaf as it were. But all three of the partners in miscegenation have a single characteristic that breeds true in the resultant offspring. There is no depth to the root system at all. I can quote no specific studies as to the depth of the root system of entire leaved red oak, the name commonly used for the water willow laurel mixture, but it can't be much more than two feet. All across the swamp in the area of the blowdowns, there are circles of earth 10 feet in diameter, held upright like giant wheels by the boles of the blown down tree protruding from the center of the circle. None of these wheels of earth, regardless of its diameter, is more than 30 inches thick. By the time I had struggled around all the obstacles, after first deciding which blowdown constituted an obstacle, it was beginning to get light, and my arrival at the open part of the pond was about 15 minutes later than it ought to have been. A flock of a dozen or so mallards flushed out of the middle of the opening as I pushed out into it. I crossed over to the east side, pulled a pirogue under a couple of bushy cypress saplings, and standing in thigh deep water next to the boat, untied the sack and began to throw the decoys out into the open water. I read one time that Harry Houdini used to sit at a table and practice tying and untying knots in a piece of twine with his toes. He went through such an exercise to make all of his appendages limber, active and useful so they could help him remove the chains and ropes that tied him when he was dropped overboard, bound, chained and nailed up in a packing crate for one of his escape performances. The article did not say what Houdini did with his hands while he was occupied in limbering up his toes, wrote letters to his family probably, or practiced dealing seconds and thirds from a deck of cards for his poker sessions. Houdini could probably keep his footing in thigh deep water, hold a boat steady with one hand, use the other hand to uncase the gun and load it, take decoys out of the sack, untangle the weights and throw them out into the water, 
watch for ducks, call at the proper time, and stay hidden all simultaneously. Whatever skill he may have eventually developed with his toes would not help him in this particular instance because his toes would be encased in chest high waders and buried a couple of inches deep in the mud throughout the operations. He would be left with only the use of his hands, teeth, and elbows, and I am not saying for an instant that he could not have done it. He probably could have and drunk a cup of coffee and whistled a violin solo from the overture to office in the underworld at the same time. But those of us who are substantially more disadvantaged in motor skill dexterity, those of us who in fact can barely pick up a piece of rope with our toes, let alone tie knots entwined with them, do a lot better when we get to the pond early enough to do several of these things at a far more deliberate pace, say like mostly one thing at a time. 